Galatians 7. And uh, when you find it, if you will, if you're physically able, let's stand for the reverence of God's Word. One more time, if you're physically able, if you're not, we understand. Uh, if you're watching online, thank you for being a part of our service. Uh, for those of you that tune in, we've got several different people that have just been a tremendous blessing to me. And you say, how can people that watch the broadcast be a blessing to you? I'll tell you one way. The other day, you know, you, you face so many things. It doesn't matter if you're serving the Lord, you're, you're in ministry or what you're doing. You're always facing the enemy. And uh, my wife, we had come up to the church on Tuesday night. We have prayer meeting every Tuesday night. We're in the prayer room, and my wife came in there, and Sister Linda may remember this, and my wife said, I want you to hear this. And there's a fellow, he may be listening tonight, maybe watch her to listen to this later on, but his name is James Burroughs. And uh, he had called and left a, a long message and just wanted to encourage me about how that he's a young preacher and that he has uh, found a lot of strength through the preaching from Grace Street Church. And you know who I give credit and honor to? I give it to the Lord. I tell you what. So I just, you know, I'm reminded that you never know who's being blessed and who's being strengthened. And I tell you what, it is such a privilege in the day we're living in to have a larger audience than what you see. Whether you realize this or not, if you have a church... And then within a day or so, you have anywhere between 200 to 700 or 1,000 people that watch a broadcast. Between all of our broadcasts, it could be even more than that. We, we have a larger audience than what you see. And that is one of the reasons that I, I have always felt that it didn't matter if there were three or there were 3,000. Sister Benefield, I felt challenged by the Lord to always take the preaching of the Word of God serious. I never know what place people are at in their life. But Haggai chapter 1, and we're going to start with verse number 5. If you have it, say amen. The Bible says here, Now therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts. I want you to say this with me. Consider your ways. Now listen to what he says. Now therefore thus saith the Lord. Who said it? The Lord. And what does he say? Consider your ways. You have sown much and bring in little. You ever felt like that before? I'm working so hard and I, I can't seem to turn a dollar. I've met people that work like that and it was just because of poor work ethic. I don't know. I put them on a scaffold and I come back three hours and they have, they're sweating, pouring sweat and they ain't moved an inch. I mean, how in the world that you can work so hard and get nothing done? Brother John knows just what I'm talking about. But he says in the Scripture here, he says, you have sown much and you bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there is none warm. He that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. That don't sound like the kind of life I want to live. And then he goes on in verse number 7. I want you to look there one more time. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. I have found that when I read God's Word and He repeats something more than once, I get the impression that God is trying to tell me, I want you to really take notice of this. There were times when I was a young man that my mom would get on to me or my dad and they would say something more than once and I got the impression that if they said it more than once, you better listen. I'm going to read it one more time and then we're going to ask the Lord to just have His divine way in this service. Thus saith the Lord of hosts. Now say it with me. Consider your ways. With the help of the Lord tonight, I want to talk to you for a while on taking inventory on my story. Raise your hand to the Lord and ask God to have his way. Lamb of God, tonight we're thankful for the privilege to stand one more time to preach the word, to hear the word, to receive the very divine truth in a world filled with such corruption and evil on every hand. God, we thank you for the zealous chastening of the Lord. But as your word said, we're to be zealous in return to repent. 
God, if there be any area of our life that you challenge us to climb higher, to dig down deeper, I pray, God, that there will be a willingness in us that we'll do whatever we need to do to make sure that our lamp is trimmed and burning should the, the Lord come at any hour. I pray, God, that our heart and lives will be ready and we'll give you the praise and glory and everyone can say amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord tonight. You'll have to forgive me. My throat's a little on the dry side tonight. I don't know. It could be from preaching, singing. I don't know exactly what it is. Sometimes I wear these ties, and I feel like I'm being choked to death. Anybody else ever feel that way? You wear it to come on? Yeah, I'm with you. But for the, for the next few moments, I don't plan to preach very long. I want to talk to you on the subject of taking inventory on my story. I'm afraid that it would be a, or it is, a very hard pill to swallow to live with regret. Regret is that thing that we look back and we say to ourselves, what if? There are those silent moments in our own minds, sometimes when we're out somewhere, maybe on a job, sometimes we're riding down the road and it's just us and our thoughts. And we look back and we think to ourselves, what if? What if I would have done this certain thing at this certain time of my life? Would things have turned out different? No doubt everybody sitting here tonight has been to that place. There's a truth among us tonight that there are people that if they could turn the hand of time back and make different decisions, they would. There are some of us tonight that there are things that you have done that you completely despise the decision that you made. There are people tonight, maybe even watching online, that you've made decisions that you had to live with, things that you had to stare at every day and understand the choice that you made put you in the place that you were in. And sometimes I find that when we live with regret, that we began to do everything in our power to ensure that the people that we love don't make the same mistakes. If you've ever fell away from God, if you've ever done things that you're not proud of, I find that we become advocates to make sure that the people we love don't make the same mistake. If you've ever been hooked on drugs, there's a certain sense about you that you become more adamant than even somebody that's never picked up a drug to make sure that the people you love so much because you know more than anybody does how much destruction that it did to your body. You know what it did to families. You know what it turned your life into. And because of that regret, you began to look it in the face and say, if I have anything to do with it, I'm going to make sure that you don't go down the same path that I do. Many times in our own homes, as parents try to raise children, we find ourselves in a place of conflict and opposition when we see that our children may be trying or attempting or even thinking about going down the same path that we once trod. When we begin to see that, something rises up within us I've noticed that parents sometimes will raise children who think that mama or daddy has a vendetta out for them. They've got a target on their back and they're just trying to make their life miserable. When in reality, it's not that they're trying to make your life miserable. What they're trying to do is keep you from going down the same road they went down to face the same pain and the same hurt and the same destruction that you felt, they felt in their life because they know what the end result was and they don't want to see you make that same choice as a parent or a grandparent or a good friend. I believe that you wouldn't be much of a parent at all if you watched somebody going down the wrong path and you didn't step in and say, hey friend, I wouldn't go that way if I were you. What kind of friend will stand by and let somebody do that? 
that sort of thing and end their life in destruction? What kind of friend that's ever been through a divorce when they see somebody in a relationship taking for granted that person that loves them so much to not step in and say, hey, hey man, wake up. You got a good wife. She's good to you. You better get your eyes back in the right place because if you don't, you're going to end up like me and you're going to lose the things that matter so much. What kind of friend would not do that if they've ever been through a place of pain? Because regret is a difficult pill for us to swallow. It's a thing inside of us that we look back and we're plagued by what if I would have done things different. I want you to understand tonight that there are things that we're going to say what if. But the reality is because you can't change it. I can't change the past, but I can do everything I can today to make sure that I don't repeat the same thing and that I do everything in my power to encourage those around me to do the right thing. Can you say amen to that? That is one of the reasons why that I preach so fervently. This is the reason why that for so many years, even in the face of sacrifice, hardship, amen, and doing without many things in my own life. Times that my own grass would be knee high, but the church grass was cut like it should be. Times of my own life that I've sacrificed my time to reach out to others, to stand outside of a restaurant while my wife, the dinner date we've waited all month long, and I'm outside on the phone trying to comfort somebody else having problems in their marriage uh, while my dinner date is in there sitting while my food is getting cold. Why would you do that? It's because I know how painful that sin can be. And I know what the enemy likes to do to destroy lives. And it's caused me to have a fervency about me. It's caused me to preach harder. It's caused me to love stronger because I fell so hard when I fell that when I finally got back up, I got back up with a resilience and I got back up with a fight and I said if I'm going to do this I am going to do it with everything within me can you say man you see the reason tonight that we often do not consider where we are in life the reason we have regrets is because somewhere along the line we didn't pause and take an inventory of our life to see how out of control that it was getting do you know tonight you don't have to be lost you don't have to be undone and not saved to have a place of your life that you can have regrets because you let things spin out of control I've watched people sit right on the church pews in and out service in service out and I've watched them become stale and lukewarm in God. They're still giving in tithes. They're still getting up singing in the choir. They're still coming and going. They're still volunteering to help around the church, but they're not maintaining that fire, amen, that God said can never go out. They're not maintaining the fire of God in their own life. And if you watch them, they begin to grow stale as we worship the Lord tonight and I walk back and forth praising the Lord. I began to say God don't ever let the candle of my passion for you don't ever let it go out because I believe that I'm saved tonight but I have found that if we're not careful that we'll begin to get caught up in going through the religious motions uh, that we played the piano for so many years that we can play it and not even think about it uh, that we can get up on the stage uh, and we can sing a song and not really think about what we're doing uh, and we began to lose the fire and the candle of our passion begins to go out and then we find ourselves in a place uh, of being stale and stagnant Uh, have you ever gone through a spiritual valley where you thought I don't know how I got here and I don't know how to get out of here I tried to pray but I feel like when I get up to pray that I'm praying against a wall sometimes the reason that is uh, is that in the good times uh, that in the times when everything was falling 
wine fair and everything was fine. We didn't get down and seek God and gain strength. Do you know that if you're going to make it in the north and you're going to make it through different seasons, if you've got to make it through the winter months, you've got to lay up certain food for the winter months because during the winter you're not pulling amen, fruit and vegetables out of the harvest field. During those winter months, you've got to make sure that you have laid up grain and you've laid up the food for the difficult times. Do you know as a child of God, just like I preached this morning, there comes times of your life that if you don't mind, the enemy will slip right in and rock you right to sleep. I've watched people that used to shout the aisles of the church, those that used to be used in the gifts of the Spirit, those that the Holy Ghost used to touch them, and they would be used by God in the most proficient ways. But today, they're rarely ever used of God. Today, they don't have the power that they one time had. It's not that they're not going to church. It's not that they're not coming and giving tithes. They're not singing or worshiping or playing instruments. But something has taken place, and the candle of their passion has slowly gone out. And I tell you, my friend, don't wake up one day and begin to pray and can't feel God or touch God like you used to. Don't let it come to that. Don't let it come to the place that you hear the cry at midnight that says, behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. And yet you have no oil in your lamp and it's not trimmed and burning. Yet you were in church last Sunday. You were in last church Sunday, last Sunday night. But yet there's no oil in the vessel. Whoa. The Bible says here, the Lord says twice, consider your ways. For a man to take an inventory, he has to backtrack and find out where it all went wrong. When you find yourself stalemate on God, it would do you good to sit down, just you and the Lord. These are the things that you do sometimes when you're not in church. I will encourage you to don't just base your entire relationship on God with an altar call at church. You need to have your own altar services at home. But I can tell you that when you get down in that private place with you and God and you ask God, how did I lose the passion? God, where did everything go wrong? What you have to do is retrace your steps When a man does an audit, a spiritual audit on his life, he begins to realize, well, you know, I haven't been praying like I used to pray. I used to make time for God. Now everything takes the place of God. I will tell you tonight that we are living in one of the most fast-paced, busiest generations that I have ever in my time of living seen before. Everybody's running wide open and none of us have time for anything but boss mans uh, and a few here and a few there, hobbies and whatnot. Listen, uh, we've got to get back to the place uh, that we're making sure we can pay our bills, uh, but at the end of the day that we're not dying with an empty soul. You might die with a full bank account and an empty soul. Listen, you can have all the trinkets and treasures of the world, but if you die lost and you don't have that fire, not only will you die lost, but you're also not going to make an impact on the lives of people around you. Can you imagine all the work that has gone undone when we begin to get cold and lukewarm on God? Can you imagine all the pulpits of preachers that should have took that 45 minutes or that hour to become so anointed that they were able to touch hearts and lives and to do what God said and feed the sheep. But instead they begin to get cold and lukewarm and they get up and preach their little warmed over over TV dinner sermon and nobody gets blessed or helped and people go home empty. Just imagine the work that goes undone when you and I began to get cold on God. Consider your ways. I want you to to read this scripture here. Look at this scripture. He said, now therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much. You bring in little 
You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. I come away reading these, these verses or these words with the impression that what God was trying to say to the church of that day, you're doing a lot of things. Your hands are busy. Your mind is busy. Your feet are busy, but they're busy with everything that's taking you away from me. Does anyone understand what I'm saying? Your mind is so busy, worried about what everybody thinks about you. Can I preach to that crowd for a few minutes? There are some people that I met and I love you. I don't mean no disrespect but you spend the majority of your time trying to impress everybody, worried about what people think about you. When's the last time you got down in an altar and said, God, are you pleased with me? You're worried about whether you can impress a boyfriend or, or a man or but worried whether you impress your boss man and worried whether you impress, hey man, the Facebook crowd and everybody else. Uh, when's the last time that you laid between the porch and the altar and sackcloth and ashes and you said, God, God, does my life please you? God, does my prayer life please you? God, does my devotion in the word of God please you? You see, when you get to that place, when there's hot passion between you and God, that's when you're gonna discover just how low that you might be. But you'll never know as long as your mind is busy and your feet are busy and your arms are busy and your life's busy, but you're too busy for God. You're going and you're doing and you're, you're going through the motions. Maybe, just maybe, I can make a difference like this. What I have found, and this is what scares me the most. I want to talk to you for a minute if you'll let me. What scares me the most is that I have seen where that there are times that God has to do something great of a great magnitude to rock a person's world to get their attention. There are marriages that two people would not still be together today if an adulterous affair or if a wife or somebody said I'm done and walked out that they wouldn't be together if something had not rocked their world and got their attention that hey if you don't wake up you're about to lose your family you're going to lose your wife you're going to lose your children you're going to lose it all if somebody had or something had not got their attention to allow them to see the great need within that marriage uh, do you know tonight there are people had they not spent time in jail and if they wouldn't have got busted or caught for what they were doing that they would not be here tonight that worries me tonight why does it have to come to that you see God is saying to you if I've got to put you at 33rd street jail and allow you to spend some time amen in a 6 by 8 for a little while to get thinking about everything you've ever done and where you went wrong I will do whatever it takes to get you on the right path There are people tonight that wouldn't still be serving God had a terminal illness not hit their family. Brother David Mobley and Sister Mobley, they drive a long way to church. They're not here tonight. I can tell you that I've heard so many testimonies over the years. But as I sat and listened to Brother David and Sister Rhonda's testimony years ago about their young daughter outside playing with some stuff, some fireworks, nearly lost her eye. When a firework went off and blew up in her eye. And they were in a place of their life that gathered around a hospital bed of a child that tragedy had struck their family and it had got their attention. You see, God says, consider your ways. And sometimes nothing says consider your ways. Nothing says do an inventory on your story like a hardship that hits your family in such a way that it makes you back up. Nothing hits you. Amen about how powerless that you become when the people that you love so much have come down with a terminal illness and you stand around their bedside and it's only then that you realize you couldn't pray off a headache if you wanted to because your prayer life ain't like it used to be. There was a time you had such faith that 
that if your wife would have got sick with stage four cancer, you could have stood by her bed and declared warfare on the enemy and rocked the gates of hell. But tonight, if you stood there, you'd be doing good to get her blood pressure back up where it should be. Why? Because you've let little things come between you and God consider your ways, says the Lord. It's time for you to do an inventory on your story. As I rode to church tonight, Sister Miranda, I began to think about the fact that God has given us two eyes to see with. And naturally with these two eyes, Brother John, as I look out, we are always looking away from ourselves. And therefore it is that much easier for us to judge the things and the people that we see in front of us. Sometimes God has to say, look, I'm going to put you in a situation, in a place where that everything comes to a screeching halt or that your life slows down to a crawl so that I can get you some time to stop and think. I can tell you that that is exactly what happened when the Lord saved me. Most of you have heard my testimony, so I'm not going to rehearse it again tonight. But sitting right on the threshold, the verge of joining the KKK, right on the verge of losing my marriage. Now, some of you didn't know that, did you? Missed joining the KKK by one phone call. Thank God for deliverance. And somebody say amen. That very day, God saw my life. And I was like that scripture. I was filling bags full of money with holes. I was eating, but it was never enough. I was living, but nothing was ever enough. I was looking outside the parameters of the covenant of my marriage and other opportunities that were outside of my marriage. God forbid I was doing things that I'm not proud of to this day. But I can tell you that God finally allowed my life to come to a screeching halt for God to say, look, you need to start thinking about where you are. I remember that all my childhood, I always dreamed of having a certain vehicle and I had a nice truck, payments were made and I had gone down to a dealership. Long story short, I got the truck that I'd wanted so bad. My wife mentioned it this morning, but that wasn't the same truck. I had got a brand, almost brand new, a Toyota truck that some concrete cowboy, that's what we called them. Those are those uh, redneck boys that try to be rednecks, but they don't ever take the truck off the road. And some concrete cowboy had fixed it all up, had big tires on it, lifted it. It was a super nice truck. And when I got that truck, I thought I was king of the hill. I thought I was on top of the world. Uh, hey man, some of you thinking, really? Yeah, I did. I was young and dumb and full of vinegar. And I thought, boy, I got life by the tail. I was working overtime. I was a workaholic. I'd work sometimes 12 to 16 hours a day without thinking twice. Uh, I've worked 24 hours straight before without sleeping at all. Nearly lost my life falling asleep at the wheel. Uh, but I did it like a crazy fiend. Uh, but one day God said, it's all got to stop. And I need you to stop. I've got a church in 2018 you're going to pastor one day and I ain't never going to get you there unless you slow down a little while and let me stop and let you see and consider what's going on if you keep going the way you're going you're going to end in destruction how did God take me from there to here sometimes God has to breathe into your ear when it's just you and him. Sometimes he does it in places that have nothing to do with church. Sometimes he uses the preacher to say things and the preacher's preaching and while he's up preaching, all of a sudden something strikes a chord in your soul and your mind goes off somewhere else and he keeps preaching and you have no idea what he's saying because God has got your number and he's reading your mail and he's talking to you and telling you, listen, if you keep going down the path that you're on right now, you're going to go the wrong direction. You see, there are people that are here tonight that are testimonies that God had a plan for you. But there are also people that 
could be here tonight or maybe watching online that God's got a plan for your life and right now you're about to foul up the whole plan. You're going to mess it all up if you don't slow down and consider your ways. If you don't realize that you're chasing the wrong dreams. You're chasing the wrong things. That if you'll slow down long enough and take an inventory, you will see the missing piece to the puzzle of your life. We have a good friend of ours we haven't talked to in years, or at least was a good close friend for many years of our ministry. Her name was Lee Greer. She was a great inspiration to us in many ways. But her testimony, it really touched my heart because as a young girl, she was raised in church. God had led her in the right direction through her mother. But her father, Brother Greer, before he was ever Brother Greer, he was going to the bars, getting drunk, chasing the wrong things in life while his wife was at home praying for him. Sister Greer was a real sold-out woman of God. Whenever Sister Lee got older, she became a teenager. She started sneaking around, doing things she shouldn't do, following after the example of that daddy. And she told that story. She said as she got older, she went off to college, if memory serves me right. One night they were sitting around a party. And she said up to that point she had done marijuana and some other things. And at that party they had some other things available other than marijuana, some hard drugs. And she said that night she looked at one of her friends and she said, give me some of that. And her friend looked at her and said, no, 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 no. She said, no, you, you, you're a good girl. You, your, mama's a, you, your mama's a woman of God and, and all this. And, and, and this kind of thing here, this ain't meant for you. She said, I looked at her and I got, kind of got angry and I said, that didn't make no difference. Let me get some of that. Well, she ended up taking that on top of alcohol and marijuana. If memory serves me right, they all piled into a convertible Mustang and headed out for the road. That night, she nearly lost her life. I don't know. I can't remember if someone died in that wreck that they went into, but they hit the top of a bridge. They were living life as they thought to the fullest, partying hard, making friends, trying to impress everybody around them, trying to be cool, trying to be popular. But when they hit the top of that bridge, that Mustang went airborne and it wrapped around Brother John a tree. And that convertible top that was on the sides where the pillars come up, it grabbed a hold of the backside of Sister Lee's uh, calf and nearly, it literally just ripped the whole calf muscle clean out of the leg. Amen. Scarred her head up, cut her head wide open. And there she laid in a hospital bed, all messed up. Amen. The, 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 the wreck had just nearly killed her, this young girl. And she lived in another state. I want to say it was like Michigan. And here her mom was living in South Florida and her dad. And her mom showed up at that hospital. And when she got there and walked into that room, uh, she was more worried about the things that mama had raised her to do than trying to amen make touch base with her mom and understand she was still alive and her mom said to her look I'm not worried about all the other stuff I'm just glad you're alive and she said it was that night and that wreck that got her attention and turned her life the other way around I remember one night as she stood in front of a large crowd of teenagers and she bawled and cried and told her testimony to a crowd full of young teenage girls she said I tried to fill my life with drugs and I thought that would fix it I tried to fill it with a relationship maybe another relationship will be what I'm after she said but I found out I was trying to put a square peg in a round hole she said it was only when God got my attention and I finally slowed down and realized the direction I was headed that God got my attention and I slowed down long enough to realize he was the missing piece to the puzzle. All those years that she ran for mama's advice and the Lord let one night be the night that he said, I've been trying to get your attention for quite a while and you haven't listened. 
I want to say something, and I'm not trying to be the prophet or the son of a prophet tonight. But buckle up and hold on. Because as we've said many times in the past, we will sometimes pray, God, do whatever it takes to get their attention. But you better start praying, God, give me the grace to bear whatever it takes. Could you look down into the face of someone that you've been praying for, all beat up, sliced up, cut up, or look down into the face of someone that you love that is absolutely dying and on their way out, maybe in a coma, praying, God, bring them out. Could you do that if that's what it takes to get their heart right? I want to tell you something. God will whisper. God will speak. I've been in church services before where the Holy Ghost gave out a message in tongues and interpretation, and I've watched conviction settle down on a person, and they look like somebody that's been doing meth. They're, they're antsy and they're fidgety, and you can tell conviction has got a hold of them. But I've watched them stay right there in that pew and do everything they could not to go to that altar and at the end of service they got up and walked out amen they stepped right over that conviction do you know you can only do that so long until God said I've got a plan for your life and if you won't slow down long enough to consider the direction and the path that you've been on I might have to let something come into your life to allow you to get to, for me to get your attention that's just how it works sometimes Parents, you better pay attention to what I'm saying. Uh, grandparents, husbands, and wives, uh, the young children, listen to what I'm telling you. It's better for you to slow down, uh, sit down and do an audit of your own life uh, and say, God, let me do an inventory of my story. God, I don't want to end up like that. I don't want to look down into the face of a stillborn child from an adulterous affair. God, I don't want to have to go through this tragedy. God, I don't want to have to deal with those things. My mind is reminded tonight of the passage of the Word of God. It's not the direction of a message, but I want to make a point. There's a portion of the Bible that says if a man looks upon a woman in lust, he has committed adultery already in his heart. And the Bible said it would be better for that man to gouge his eye out and go to heaven with one eye seeing than to go to hell with both eyes. It would be better for that man. That's pretty serious. In other words, you'd be better off to make a decision like that so that you don't allow your own sight to betray you. Is that how serious my salvation is? Can anybody in this room imagine walking into the kitchen and grabbing mama's butcher knife? And gouging your own eye out. I mean, that sounds torturous and that sounds unbelievable. God wasn't really asking anybody to gouge their eye out. What God was saying, this is how critical your salvation is. I, you can't afford to let anything stand between me and you. Not a relationship with a person. Not a friendship with a person. Not, a, not, a, not an association with anything. You cannot afford to let anything stand in the way. And if God has to, he'll let you spend some time on the backside of the desert. He'll let you spend 40 years wandering in the wilderness until he can get Egypt out of you before he takes you into Canaan land. God has a way of getting our attention and all I'm asking you tonight to do is before God has to get your attention buckle up, buckle down and get right with God. I'm a little concerned with this message tonight. I, I, I didn't plan to preach everything I preach to you tonight and I'm a little bit concerned. Somebody say help us tonight. Why do we have to let things get that far? Why? It's because we fail to do an inventory of what's really going on. Is it because if you start thinking to yourself as long as I don't talk about it, as long as I don't think about the things that I've been doing that mama don't know, that my wife don't know, that the church don't know, that the pastor does, as long as I don't think about it, 
then we're good. But the Lord says, the eyes of the Lord, they go to and fro in the earth and he sees and he knows things that the preacher may never know. He sees and knows things that mom and daddy may never know. I can tell you tonight that if God, I, I'm going to say some things tonight that may be very, very specific, and I'm just asking you to pray for me, saints of God, because I know the Lord has a reason why that I'm saying these things. If God has to spare your soul, he will do whatever he has to do, even if that means exposing your sin. I want you to hear me. I've said this and preached this over the years many times, but God is a gentleman. And this is the way that the Lord works. He's such a gentleman that if you're doing things you shouldn't do, He'll use the preacher to preach the message. He'll use the word of God to you read a text or you may even hear something on the radio going down the road. But God's such a gentleman that he'll say, you know that thing you did the other night. I'm not happy about that. You know that that's not right. You need to repent of that. You need to quit doing that. He's a gentleman. He'll get in your ear. He'll get in your heart. He'll begin to speak to you in the privacy of your own thoughts. He's such a gentleman. But God knows that there, has a, there is a time and a place in our life that we will cross over a threshold into something that will destroy us completely. And if he doesn't step up to the plate and let something happen and transpire, you will ruin your own self. And it's in those times and places that after he's been a gentleman and he's nudged you, he's used conviction, he's drew you, he's tried to talk to you, and you just keep pushing him off. You keep doing what you've been doing. It's in those times that God says, all right, I've tried and I've tried and I've tried. You're still going to church. You're still going through the motions, but you're also still doing some things that you ain't supposed to be doing. I want to tell you tonight that it is time for you to take an inventory not on your friends, not on your other family members, not on your spouse, not on your pastor. It's time for you to take an inventory on your story. How is my life unfolding? What, what path have I been on? I read to you in the text, and I want to read this one more time as you stand all across the church. I want you to hear what the Lord said to the church of the Old Testament. Now, therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. We drop down just one verse, and once again, he says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. I want you to. I want you to stop and I want you to start thinking because you haven't been doing much of that lately. You've been doing your thing and you forgot all about my word. You forgot all about my ways. You forgot all about my spirit. You forgot all about my drawing. I have a plan for you, but you're going to run right out, right away from that plan if you don't wake up. As heads are bowed and eyes are closed tonight, I want to give you an opportunity right now, right this minute, to just step out and say, I'm willing to acknowledge right now. I don't care who's looking at me. Sometimes that acknowledgement, that place of remorse to say, I know I've messed up, I know I've done wrong, heads are bowed and nobody's looking around. I want you to be the first one to just step out and say, I don't care what anybody thinks tonight. I want to make sure that I know that I know that I know that I don't have to be that one that ends up in a tragic situation for God to get my attention. I'm going to find myself a place right now on the altar and I'm going to beg God for mercy. I'm going to beg God to speak to me and to touch me in the mighty name of Jesus. If that's you, I want you to come right now right now. I want you to come right now. I want you to come right now and say, God, please don't let it come to that. You've done it before. You've allowed things to transpire before to get my attention and I suffered 
for a long time because of it, and I want to make sure that I know. <laughs> I want to know that I know that I know that there's nothing standing between me and the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Right here and right now, I want you to take an opportunity and I want you to talk to God and I want you to tell Him exactly what you want Him to do. Lord, cleanse me of my own impure thoughts. If there's something that you have been struggling with, I encourage you right now to say, God, I'm putting it on the altar. I don't care if you pray quiet. I don't care if you pray loud. Just pray. Just talk to him. God, please. There are some things as parents, there are some things as grandparents, and there are things as friends that we have others that we love tonight that are headed down the wrong path. Would you be willing tonight to do like Abraham and stand in the gap for Lot. Abraham stood in the gap for Lot and his family, and he said, Lord, if there be just ten in that city, Lord, if they just be a handful in that city with a heart set to serve you, will you, will you not destroy them? Will, will you spare the house? Is that you tonight? You say, God, I've got a grandson tonight. God, I got a boy. I got a daughter. I got a I got a daughter in law. Lord, I got I got a I got a friend that I've been so close to for years. And if they don't get right, if they don't turn their heart fully back to you, there's no telling what's gonna happen. Let me ask you a question, Mama. Would you rather pray now or would you wait until your son is laying in a hospital bed with breathing tubes and machines keeping him alive? in a coma because I want to tell you tonight the reality is all of the above is possible if you could look forward in time 15 years from now and find out that you're going to be in prison would you want to get before God right now and say Lord don't let me end up in that place I tell you tonight that if it wasn't for the mercy of God that you're you're just sitting underneath a pastor that could have easily gone to prison for some of the things I did. But for the mercy of God. And because when God came along in August of 1997, I heard the preaching of the word and I got down before the Lord and I considered my ways. I want to ask you just how powerful are you in the Lord? Was there a time that you used to really have it? Was there a time that the fire of God was so strong and emanated from your life that everywhere you went, that you were able to lay hands on the sick, you were able to cast out demons, you were able to be a great influence, but tonight that influence is not like it used to be. God used you to pray for other people to get the victory, and tonight you're doing good to keep the victory yourself. God, don't let the candle of my passion go out. God, don't let the candle of my passion go out. I want to make sure that my lamp's trimmed and burning, oh God. It's times just like this in a church that we're able to get rooted and grounded in God. Lord, let my spiritual roots grow deeper. I don't want to be a shallow Christian. I don't want to be the kind that can shout, but I don't have any depth to my soul. I don't want to be the kind that feels.